welcome. It's our third annual meeting of the Matagorda Bay Ecosystem Assessment uh, Project here based in Matagorda Bay. If you wanna to go to the next slide. So the agenda is real short and sweet. Most of today we'll be covering research updates for the assessment. I'd just like to cover my bit here in a few minutes. So if you'd like to go to the next slide. So my name is Chelsea Jones. I work with the Natural Resources Program at the Texas Comptroller's Office, and we're funding the assessment. We're kind of a unique group because we receive funding from the Texas legislature to fund research at Texas public universities. The goal of this research is typically either to inform the Federal Endangered Species Act and some of the processes involved there, or to promote long-term conservation. Next slide. I always like to show this photo when I'm trying to tie in the program to Matagorda Bay. Um, I think this photo is really cool. It's, it's taken from Magnolia Beach and it really exemplifies that Matagorda has a lot going on at any given moment and it's complex. So if you go to the next slide, here I've listed the main research goals of the assessment and we'll cover these in more detail today. But in a nutshell, it's, it's kind of taking all these complexities and trying to study them at a system level. We've got experts from all sorts of disciplines, be it species, habitats, water, and we're asking them to work together to study the system now in time. And I think as we go on today, you'll hear not only has this model been effective and it's finding interesting facts about Matagorda, but it can also be used in future studies. And last slide. My role in this, unfortunately, I don't get to get my feet wet as often as I want. Um, instead, I work on the contract side of things, making sure that this group has the time and resources they need to have a successful project. When we signed this contract in the summer of 2019, I don't think any of us knew what 2020 or 2021 had in store. That said, this team has taken it all in stride and this project has built a lot of momentum and it's something that we wanna support going forward. So we've updated the contract, amended it for another year. That's another year for data collection, analysis and outreach like this. So we get to meet this time next year and talk about what these system level findings are starting to show about Matagorda Bay. But thanks for tuning in. Now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Stenz. All right, thanks Chelsea. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> All right, well, I'm Greg Stenz. Um, I'm at the Heart Research Institute at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and I'm the principal investigator among a, a bunch of other really outstanding scientists who are doing a lot of work on this project and you'll hear from them today. Um, of course, we're represented here at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, Texas A&M University and Texas A&M Galveston and uh, BioWest. And you'll hear from a few scientists from each of these groups today. And <clears throat> because there may be some new people, as Chelsea mentioned, this is the third you know, annual stakeholder meeting, but there's new people each time. So I wanna just give a very brief introduction of the project so everybody's kind of on, on the level playing field of, of understanding what what the main goals are but i really want to leave time for our scientific teams to talk about where we are with the project and that sort of thing i'm, I'm happy to report we're, we're really in a good place in terms of timeline and getting the work done we've done the lion's share of the field work at this point of course there's still more to do and and, and lab work to do but most of the data uh, is in the process of being collected now we're just really working on analyzing and uh, making sense of that data and developing ways to uh, assimilate this project um, and provide some final data products. Um, and so hopefully in a year we'll be back really talking about you know the, the main take home findings and that sort of thing. But I can tell you we've been very successful and our teams have been working very hard to really have a better understanding of the Matagorda Bay ecosystem, which was really the overall goal of this project. Of course, sea turtles um, were driving that in terms of endangered species. Uh, subsequent to that, a, a major boat bird component was brought in. And of course, we're studying the foundational species and the habitats that support all this activity, as well as water quality. And uh, in general, the ecosystem uh, function through food web analyses to really understand what's fueling these marine ecosystems and keep keeping them functional. But it really goes a, a little beyond that. This is one of the real 
first scale projects at this level that really adopts the ecosystem approach where we're looking at everything from the base of the food web all the way up to the larger, more charismatic species. And, and that's really important because that leads to this ecosystem based management sort of design where you don't really manage individual species, but if you're managing the entire ecosystem and managing for a healthy ecosystem, the, the bay is resilient and really takes care of itself. But we often have limited understanding of, well, what, what is a healthy ecosystem and how do you do ecosystem-based um, management? And, and this project is really gonna be a great case study, I think for years to come on how to do that. And so with that overall project goal in mind, when it really got, gets down to it, so what, is, what does this mean for Matagorda Bay? Well, of course, the bird component and sea turtles are what really are driving this project. And we wanna develop effective means for conservation of those species, restoration where necessary. And what does that look like for those, spe those species now and in the future? And certainly having a baseline of information is really important to do that. But most importantly, what all this information feeds into is what, what are the future priorities for Matic Gorda Bay? What, what areas should we be conserving? What areas are prime areas for mitigation or offset or habitat restoration, for example? And when we bring together a multidisciplinary team like this, we can really begin to looking at these ecosystem assessments from you know, the fundamental components that I'm talking about and then and, and what will happen with Jim Jabot's component and his outstanding um, expertise he has with mapping and visualization will really bring this um, all together in a, in a very uh, user-friendly uh, format to understand the science we've generated. And so um, with that, I'll, I'll kind of getting ready to turn it over to Dr. Jabot, Jim. So if you're almost ready, I'll forward the slides for you, but I wanna kind of put it into perspective. This, this map is something that we've seen over and over. It really captures the study in kind of a one-stop shop, which is very hard to do. But everything within that yellow outline there you see of Matagorda Bay is the focus area of the project. Uh, I'm pleased to support uh, report that there's been a lot of spinoff projects. Some of those you'll briefly just hear about today and all kind of other work that's going on that, that everyone's well aware of in Matagorda Bay that we're even involved with. So this project has been really great about leveraging some of that to really expand our project to, to the full reaches of Matagorda Bay. And we're, we're really proud um, about that. And I'm not gonna go into introducing each of the expert science team. You're gonna hear from each one of them today and they can do a brief introduction. We've done that many times in the past. I think it's more important to hear specifically about the science since we, we've had those introductions. But essentially we're gonna start with um, Jim Jabot um, to talk about um, some of the progress on mapping that he's been doing and some of the updates from his team. So Jim, if, if you're ready to go, I'll go ahead and forward it. Um, um, to the next slide here in just a second. Are you there, Jim? Uh, yes, I am. Great. Okay, good. So anyway, and I think you'll see at the end of our um, uh, uh, talk today, you will really have a good idea of, you know, what what's the current state of the baseline habitats and water quality that we have going on in Matagorda Bay. Jim is going to inform us how those change over time from a, from a mapping perspective. And then probably most important, how are those going to change um, it for in the future and, and how can we do beneficial things to conserve, conserve this special place that we know as um, Matagorda Bay. So with that, Jim, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you for um, your components. Uh, great, thank you, Greg. Um, and yes, my name's Jim Jabot and I'm here at the Heart Research Institute. And um, my lab's portion of this project is to primarily conduct uh, some mapping and to create a a baseline map um, that's representative of environments on the ground uh, recently. Um, and so to do that, uh, we are using uh, satellite-based imagery. Uh, it's called Worldview 2 imagery and it's high resolution, multi-spectral imagery. It's like Landsat but at a much higher resolution, it's a two meter resolution. And so it's, that, that means it's a lot of data, a whole lot of data. And so uh, we have been uh, working uh, this last year uh, a great deal on training our data classifications of that satellite imagery. And if we look in the left uh, column there, 
Uh, you can see lines uh, where the uh, part of the uh, study area has been segmented into separate spectral uh, signatures. And then uh, we've just have gone through and looked at those uh, segments. And this is just a portion of the study area and classified them um, for what they are, what we know they are on the ground uh, in, into our classifications. And then uh, we take a look at that information and we saw what we were able to break out you know, or not break out because uh, some of these different land covers such as marshes and algal flats look the same in the spectral imagery. And so uh, we continued our analysis to determine just what we would be able to break out reliably, reliably in a, a classification, an automated classification. Um, and uh, we had to combine, um, for example, uh, shrubs and trees into one classification and then uh, marsh and algal flats into one classification. Um, but we have a strategy to separate those. Now I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one of the first things we do is map the water. And then once we get the water mapped, then we go and map the uh, intertidal to uh, um, upland areas, as you see in the map on the right. And our uh, water mask uh, works very well. It, we're using a, a normalized difference water index. And you can see the, these in the notes on the slide there, um, but it, it works great. And at two meter resolution, uh, we're very happy with that. And next, please. And so we uh, have our training data, uh, which is, is time consuming and so a, a critically important step um, to train the classification for, for the rest of the entire data uh, study area. And in order to do this, uh, we have tried uh, several different things, uh, perhaps more than several, but we've landed on actually um, creating spectral indices. Um, we combine bands into these uh, different indices, and those are on the left-hand column there. Um, structure, sensitive pigment index, shadow index, and then the modified soil adjusted vegetation index. And each of those indices uh, take advantage of the different um, bands, the different frequencies in the Worldview 2 data, and um, are do a good job pulling out those um, classifications. And um, then we take those three bands and we create another uh, image, a three band image, so to speak. And uh, then we run pixel based classifications and we have an ensemble of five different classifications that you can see there in the middle column. And each of them um, are worked on individually and classified into those um, units that you see. Uh, in the middle column, the high, flat beach, shrubs, trees, grass, marshes, algal flat, open water. Uh, of course, we got the open water before from our um, uh, water mask that we uh, created. And then uh, we we um, take each of those five ensembles and we uh, classifications into an ensemble and we um, determine the uh, most likely um, class of each pixel. And um, so this is um, proved to, to work very, very nicely so far. Now, I mentioned that we still, we had to uh, combine those units that we would really like to um, um, break out. And so for that, we uh, have a two meter digital elevation model that is LIDAR based that we've developed and from existing data, I should add. And um, Using that DEM, we can now take this classified image and separate marsh from algal flats be because of the um, topographic signature in the LIDAR data, shrubs and trees from grass and high flats from beach, and uh, combine this uh, ensemble method to classify the entire area then. Next, please. 
Um, we also are look, going back in time, um, as Greg mentioned, um, we need to go back and see how things have changed and also um, project how things may change in the future. And so we're using a lot of aerial photography going back and you can see a table of of those phot photographic um, images that we're using. Next, please. There are 11 total dates that we've mapped the uh, Matagorda Peninsula, which is a very dynamic place and the, the Colorado um, Delta, which is also very dynamic. And here's an example of some of these changes that we see. On the left is uh, Pass Cavallo, and uh, it has been going through a lot of changes um, uh, since the uh, 60s in particular. And uh, due to uh, the dredging, largely due to the dredging of the Matagorda ship channel. So that's a, a man-made activity that has had a huge impact on um, I, I, I would uh, say all of Matagorda Bay, um, but particularly in the area here um, in Pass Cavallo as well. And then on the right is an area of, of these um, differences um, through time and how the Colorado River Delta has grown and contracted. And next, please. And here on the left is a graph of total land area uh, through time, uh, starting in 1972 of that Matagorda Peninsula and um, Colorado River Delta area. And you can see uh, things changed. Um, we're pretty um, increased in area um, from the 80s, by the 80s or so, um, early 70s. And it was relatively stable. But since 2015, we've had have had a decrease in land area or an increase in open water area in this region. And on the right are some examples of some of these changes. Uh, there was an inlet that was opened in the uh, early 40s uh, on the eastern part of the Matagorda Peninsula, and a lot of sand was transported landward into the bay, which provides substrate for other environments. And you can see how that has changed and transitioned and become vegetated through time. And so we will, um, this is my last slide, we'll be uh, taking these data and um, matching it up with um, uh, hurricane uh, records and uh, precipitation and sea level rise um, to give us more insight into how things change around here. And uh, we have some existing sea level rise um, data that we can also apply to the problem to look more into the future. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Jabot. That was great. And, and obviously a lot more of this to come. And I hope that gives you a little bit of taste of, of some of the mapping work that, that we've got going on as far as the project. And of course, um, Dr. Jabot's team is leading that. So thanks, Jim. Um, uh, up next, um, Ed O'Borney from BioWest is going to talk about some of the um, subtitle kind of mapping that he's been doing at Oyster Reefs and other things. And I know he he talked some about that last time, so I asked him just briefly update everyone because it was such an important component, but that has been completed. But since then, Ed has been moving his focus to the bird component, which is also the other aspect which he's going to spend a little more talking time talking on tonight. So, Ed, are you ready at this point? I am good. Thanks, Greg. All right. Uh, Whenever so, you're ready. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Perfect. All right. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. As Greg mentioned, we're going to take a step back in time about uh, a year ago and talk a little bit about the uh, benthic habitat mapping. So uh, Dr. Jabot talked about uh, mapping the water and then mapping all the land around it and the vegetation. We're mapping the bottom, the, what's on the bottom of the water. And we talked about this at the last meeting, but just a couple highlights. This is a shot of our main project area that we did the benthic habitat mapping. This is side scan sonar. So we essentially had a boat that went back and forth transects for a long period of time. And we mowed the bay, uh, shot the pictures on the bottom. And uh, you can glance up there on that upper right and see pretty nice uh, stretches of oyster reefs. Uh, I didn't label everything because I don't want you to see where the treasure chest of gold are that we picked up on the bottom uh, because we had fine print in our contract for that, Chelsea. 
but this is the this is the bottom mapping of the harder substrates. Next slide. We could also take that information while we were out there and shot the bathymetry. So we have the depths throughout this entire area, which is extremely valuable when you're looking at what's happening with respect to sediment and turbidity and and water quality, et cetera. And so we have that bathymic, uh, bathymetric component. And then last slide on this topic. And then we also did a detailed mapping of the seagrass coverage uh, a year ago in the summer of 2020, understanding that seagrasses move. Um, however, we did a very thorough look and then all this was followed by ground truthing where we went out and ground truthed oyster reefs and the side scan uh, sonar work as well as the seagrass work. So what it really does is provides a nice really nice view of these open water type of habitats that really haven't been studied that much in the past and they're going to feed right into the uh, overall ecosystem approach. So next slide. So anytime you follow Jim, you got to put some pretty pictures in because uh -huh. Jim is just so data heavy and, and so smart that I have to throw in pretty pictures to, uh, you know, try to look good. So, you know, the next thing we're out there doing is coastal bird surveys. We've got the six uh, study sites, three are on the barrier islands and three are back in the intercoastal areas, uh, Mad Island Marsh, Oyster Lake, and also in the Colorado Delta. So we were out there three times this past year and we have one more winter trip coming up in December. And we located over 6,000 birds, a lot of the target species, and uh, you know, there's some really cool habitats out there. Next. In addition to point counts, where you visually go out there at a certain points, cover different transects, and you actually visually ID the birds, we also have acoustic recording devices that are out there. We put them out at all our sites when we're out in the field uh, and leave them over the course of the time while we're out there next. So we also then have you know, over 1,300 hours of acoustic recording that you have to then filter through. And we've developed uh, classifiers for both the black rail and hooping cranes and have, have been processing with those classifiers as well. And so far we've picked up both black rail, we've picked up black rails as well as hooping cranes. We haven't made it all the way through all that information, but it's, it's a pretty cool way of getting additional data. And we have those files forever. If anybody wanted to develop other classifiers to go back in and look through that data. Next. Additionally, we're helping out with some of the marsh vegetation surveys and the biomass work. And so we did another round of surveys this past year in the spring at the starting growing of the growing season and then in the fall at the kind of the conclusion of the growing season. I uh, spent a lot of time out there, collected a lot of information, including you know inundation levels and salinity and algal mats. And, and, and this tied in so nicely to the bird work, which were in the same areas at these six study sites. Next slide. And then when you're going through and putting together presentations, sometimes you get pictures that are just too good not to include. And so I included these. I didn't know if Greg was going to include them or not, but we're not doing a pollinator study out there. But on the barrier island, you get the beautiful flowering that happens on some of this vegetation. And you can see the bee on the left and the butterfly on the right. Uh, and so, you know, we're all biologists. When you see a cool pic, you, you got to put it in there and hope it makes it. So it made it, so I'm excited. It also shows just the ecosystem diversity. And, and Greg mentioned earlier, we're covering a lot of components on this, but these are such productive systems. Sometimes you forget about other components such as pollinators. So it's super, super cool environment. Next slide. Uh, kind of a, you know, so this is a second full year of marsh vegetation surveys. We continue to see that the barrier islands have a little more diversity with respect to the types of vegetation that are there, which is very important for certain uh, ecosystem components. And the, inter, the intercoastal areas have uh, a lot more biomass, but it's more Spartina dominated, you know, marsh vegetation. So it's, again, it's, it's a really good baseline characterization. We have a couple seasons to characterize data and it's really gonna feed into the food web studies. And then last slide. Oh, one, one before the last. And so the other thing we've been playing with this year is uh, trying not to wreck our drone and uh, going out there and, and taking some really good video to, to help ground truth, but also kind of expand 
some of the marsh vegetation work. You know, you'll run a transect and you can get a lot of vegetation data collected along that transect, but it can be very labor intensive. So you go out and you fly the transect when you're done, and obviously when you're done doing the bird work as well, and you can characterize a much bigger area. So we're trying to use some of that documentation as well to kind of expand uh, some of the, the biomass work that we've been doing. And it's been it's been super cool, uh, you know, a little bit on the cutting edge, but we're going to apply some of that as as well. So then last slide. And then upcoming, Greg mentioned most of the field work has been completed. The vegetation work is done for now. We're processing information. We still have an upcoming winter trip for birds and then uh, another one in 2022 as well as the spring. And then we'll be wrapping up and, and analyzing all this and plugging it in with the rest of the team. So these were the components we've covered. Uh, it's It's been a super cool project thus far and we look forward to incorporating all that, incorporating all this with the rest of the project team. Back to you, Greg. Well, thanks, Ed. That's great. And as you can see, Ed's team has certainly been very busy with with a lot of components of this project. And we appreciate Ed. Ed didn't mention either. You know, he's been a real team player and getting a lot of us in the field, a lot of groups, and really, really pitching in where necessary. And so we really appreciate that. That always helps um, with the efficiency and getting the projects done. So, so thanks a lot, Ed. We appreciate that. Um, Dr. Pollock is going to talk next and. Uh, Jenny, if you're ready to talk about some of the food web components as well as oyster reefs and some interesting things that she's discovered up in Matagorda Bay. So if you're ready, Jenny, uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Greg. I'm going to attempt to leave my camera on, but my computer keeps telling me that I'm unstable. So we'll see how this works. But um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to give an update on this project. Um, this is actually pretty fun for me to see, um, you know, up fresh fresh data from the other parts of the team as well. So this is also um, an interesting process beyond just presenting. So our piece of the study is to attempt to evaluate the ecological structure and function of habitats. So of the intertidal and subtidal habitats in the Matagorda Bay system. And our research is using kind of a, a, a two-pronged approach. And so we're combining what I would call traditional analysis, ecological analysis. So we're looking at organisms that live in the different habitats. We're measuring their abundance, their biomass, and looking at different diversity metrics. But we're also combining this with food web analysis. And so this would include uh, looking at stable isotope composition of, of food sources, so primary producers, as well as their um, primary consumers and higher uh, trophic level consumers as well. So the way that the reason that we're using this kind of dual approach is that um, using these two different tools can really help provide complementary inf information that can help us better understand not just the structure of these ecosystems, but the fun their functioning as well. So the first the first habitat that we've been looking at in the Matagorda Bay system are oyster reefs. And so this piece is to compare the faunal community, so the, the organisms that live amongst the oyster reefs, um, across harvested oyster reefs, as you can see in this kind of upper right portion of the slide, as well as unharvested reefs. And so this is a picture of uh, my PhD student, Alyssa Outhwaite. A lot of this work is the basis of her dissertation. So she's sort of the expert on this. Um, but you can see really clearly here, one of the first things that we've started to discuss in this project is looking at her collecting from this unharvested reef versus the harvested reef, just the very different visual structure that you can see from these reefs. So although we're collecting on these harvested reefs that are out in the middle of the bay, and we're collecting these unharvested reefs that are um, closer to the marshes, we've started to talk about, uh, can you advance it, Greg? So, Maybe this isn't just an unharvested versus harvested reef story, but there may be some nuance in here that is important to capture. So if you can go one more slide, Greg. We are not exactly sure what this nuance is, but we definitely see differences in the physical structure of these reefs. So rather than talking about harvested versus unharvested, we're now discussing should we be talking about these unharvested reefs as fringing. You can see where Alyssa is right there, and there's those fringing reefs are right up against um, so, some salt marsh. 
uh, or maybe these are higher connectivity reefs with greater flow of organisms and organic matter um, from adjacent habitats versus these harvested reefs, again, which look maybe we should be calling open water reefs. They're really out there in the middle of the bay. Um, those are those those polygons, that hard structure that Ed was showing in the upper right of his map. Um, these are also more consolidated. You can see that there's a, a bunch of pelicans sitting on that reef. They're also higher energy. You can just see the waves um, that are interacting with that open water harvested reef versus this lower energy oyster reef that's that's fringing. So I just want to kind of say that we're starting to learn, or maybe I should say the bottom line is that there are two very different and unique types of oyster reefs present in Matagorda Bay. One of them is this special, unique, unharvested reef that's adjacent to these marsh habitats. And the other one is this consolidated open water reef that is targeted by commercial fishermen. So I just kind of wanted to say that one of the things that we're learning from the study is it's not as simple as harvested versus unharvested. There are other things happening as well. Um, next slide, please, Greg. I just wanted to show a couple of figures from data that we've collected on the oyster reefs. Um, First off, our sampling is complete. Um, the symbols on these figures are um, corresponding to the to the harvested and the unharvested reefs. But again, keep in mind those harvested ones are those consolidated open water reefs with the pelicans sitting on them, and the unharvested reefs are those um, fringing reefs where Alyssa was collecting oysters. The top panel here is looking at density of oysters. The middle panel is size of oysters and the bottom panel is their biomass or their weight. And um, if you can advance again, Greg. So the takeaways here is that there are, is a higher density of oysters and there's high bio, higher biomass. So they're heavier oysters, both at those harvested sites, but they also have greater variability. So we see big oysters and we see really little oysters. We don't see a lot of consistency. Whereas within those fringing reefs, we see a lot more consistency in um, density and and weight of the oysters that we are we're observing. That middle panel, you can see that oyster size is very similar between the reef types. And then if you could advance one more time, Greg, please. And hopefully one more. Okay, there we go. Perfect. The really interesting thing here that really builds on work that actually Greg's group has done in the past in Matagor Matagorda Bay and other systems, as well as my group has done in the past in other systems as well, is that, so this is a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling plot, but th so this is a three-dimensional rendering of similarity of communities of organisms on these reefs, okay? And the way that you interpret this plot is there are no axes, it's just the closer these points are together in space, the close or the more similar those communities of organisms are. And what you can see here is that the communities of organisms living on those harvested open water consolidated reefs are dissimilar from those on the unharvested fringing potentially higher connected reefs. And so even though we're seeing similarity in the size of the oysters in the in the other panel, we are seeing that these unique reef types appear to be hosting unique communities of organisms, meaning if you lose one, it's not replaced by the other. So for example, if you lose some of this fringing reef, you are not finding the same community of organisms hosted by those open water reefs. Um, this has, for me, it, for some of you who know me, know that I have a lot of interest in restoration, and this is an incredibly insightful finding for thinking about restoring oyster reefs. If you restore subtitle reefs, these data would indicate you're not supporting the community of organisms that lives in these intertidal areas. And so, you know, this is really useful um, information that goes way beyond this project. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so another study that we're looking at outside of oyster reefs is comparing um, the benthic macrofaunal community and trophic structure on these wind tidal flats. And so, um, some of you may be familiar with these wind tidal flats that are um, that comprise this dense mat of cyanobacteria um, that you can see here that blue green color um, that really holds the sediment together. That's Alyssa's hand where she's collected some of it and kind of broken it. It's almost like a thick kind of rubbery uh, mat that forms by this cyanobacteria 
forming a layer by the area drying out during low tide periods with very little inundation, sand blowing on top, more cyanobacteria kind of cementing it together. So it's this very unique layer of organic matter that is formed in these areas. And we are very curious because we know that they're targeted by a lot of um, feeding birds in the area to characterize the faunal community, which are prey, which are food source for those birds, but also organic matter contributions in the area. And so you go to the next slide, please. So we've completed three of our four samplings in the tidal flats. We're doing this seasonally. And um, we've just begun to analyze our data. Again, we're collecting um, benthic macrofauna using cores um, from the sediments in the tidal flats as well as in the adjacent marsh and trying to characterize again the community of organisms as well as the organic matter contributions that these habitats are providing to prey organisms which then are used in the higher trophic levels. Okay, and one more slide please, Greg. And if you can advance again, I think it should bring up the map. Okay, and if you advance one more time. Okay, no, sorry, goodbye. All right, perfect. All right, so this is the third and final piece of the puzzle is that we are trying to use um, some of our stable isotope tools to understand the role of these different habitats in providing organic matter into the Matagorda Bay food web. So this hopefully is the piece that can help link a lot of the different teams together. BioWest was a huge, um, a huge resource for us in collecting these data. But as you can see here, all these points are where data were collected from BioWest as well as from my team. So the red on here are the places where they sampled for oysters and then shared those oysters with us. Um, the green are places that they ground truth the seagrass and shared those samples with us. And then the white plate, the white um, squares on here are where we went out and actually took benthic cores of non-vegetated bottom to look at the influence of benthic microalgae. So tiny, um, um, tiny algae that are living in the sediments of Matagorda Bay that we also think play an important role in fueling the food web. And then last slide is just, uh, I guess I need to put a nice sunset picture behind it like Ed did, but just <laughs> to show our, our sample uh, progress where we are in the project. As I said, all the oyster reef samples have been collected. Um, a lot of the processing of the, um, the fauna are complete. We are in progress still with some of our isotope analysis. Those bay samples, that refers to that last map. So all that sampling was complete and we're in process in terms of looking at the faunal community, core samples, as well as the isotope samples. And then we're sampling one more time on the tidal flats. And we are really, this is the one that we're kind of just getting started on right now. So in progress in terms of processing our samples, but we are on track for this one as well. And uh, like Ed said, um, when the project is wrapping up, we'll be excited to plug plug our information in with the rest of the team to get, you know, really the comprehensive story of what's happening in Matagorda Bay. Well, thanks, well, Dr. Thanks, Polly. Dr. Polly. Uh, that, uh, that's that's great. Thanks. great. And yeah, so I think so you I, see there's some, Ginny, I think yeah. she, she sees similar patterns in other bays as well. Oh, Obviously, awesome. this has some big restoration uh, implications. And so there's some really key and interesting findings. So I think we're all going to be interesting for, for everyone's group when we really tie this up in a year uh, of what we're finding. But moving on, um, up next, uh, Dr. Wells is going to present on the Texas A&M Galveston, Galveston group and some of the work they've been doing on Necton and the food web components that they're responsible for there as well. So Dave, if, if you're up and ready to go whenever you're ready, all right. Thank you, uh, Greg. Thanks, everybody, for giving us an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit. Um, so this first set of slides are um, from uh, one of uh, Dr. Rooker's graduate students, Liam Batchelder and Dr. Rooker, that are really focused on looking at the value of nursery habitat with uh, Dr. Stunts's group, um, basically kind of trying to quantify um, you know, both the, the fish and the uh, benthic invertebrates that are recruiting to these habitats to um, kind of, you know, quantify the value of these, these different nurseries. And so some of the metrics that they're using uh, include um, straight up abundance, density of these recruits in inhabiting these different nurseries. And I'll talk about what, it, what, we're, what we mean by nurseries. We're really focusing on the different habitat types, um, seagrass, 
uh, the Spartina marsh habitat, uh, that the, the the different habitats themselves. Um, and then number two metric is the taxonomic diversity, uh, specifically the species richness, number of different species of the uh, juvenile assemblages that are um, uh, recruiting to these different habitats. Um, the more, the better. Basically, uh, you if a, a freeze comes through, may you know an anthropogenic uh, effect comes, uh, you're you're more robust to withstand that if you have a nice diverse uh, ecosystem. And then the last one, uh, nutritional condition indices, RNA DNA re ratios are commonly used. Um, higher values, basically, um, those fish have higher um, uh, essentially caloric intakes. They're just better quality fish, um, and they they may have a higher chance of survival. So they're using um, these these key metrics to kind of uh, collectively uh, quantify uh, nursery habitat quality. Okay, Greg. And so um, there's a picture of Liam pulling his benthic sled, working hard uh, as he always does. Um, and you know the some of this gear type that uh, liam's using is really focused at the early life stages and so he's using the benthic sled um, from 2019 all the way up to uh this this next month december 2021 to quantify um, the number of these recruits and um, in, in the metrics that we talked about before both density and uh, diversity species richness and you can see in the top right corner uh, a map that you've probably seen quite a bit with the different um, quarterly sites that Liam's been going to. In addition, there's a small subset of three sites that he's been visiting monthly, May through October. And they're all coded S, seagrass, some M, marsh, and then some S and M, which are sites that have both seagrass and marsh. Okay, Greg. Um, some preliminary results, uh, we've got density, uh, the number of fish per meter squared on the left-hand side, and you've got a color code of habitat type, green being your seagrass, and uh, orangish brown being your marsh edge. And you can see that the uh, seagrass habitats are having, uh, owing higher density of fishes. And then over on the right, we've got taxonomic richness, on the y-axis at the family level and again green being seagrass orange being marsh edge once again seeing a uh, higher uh, taxonomic richness specifically summer and fall um, relative to the marsh edge so what it, what what does this show us it's showing us that uh, the seagrass may be um, an, a, a very important habitat uh, for these these recruits of these these different fish um, in the Matag Matagorda Bay ecosystem. Okay, great. And so these are some nice color coded plots that Liam put together, um, looking at the taxonomic composition of uh, all the different uh, diverse fish families, which are the different colors throughout the year. So you've got spring, summer, fall, and winter. And you can see just how how beautiful all those colors are. What that uh, shows, though, is just how diverse um, the ecosystems are here with all of these little early life stage recruits. We're not talking about the big fish here. You know, the 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 gear is very selective for some of these, you know, small larvae and early juvenile stages that are settling into these these different habitat types. And so you can see how the colors are kind of changing. Um, showing the temporal uh, differences from one uh, one season to the next. Um, but you can also kind of see uh, some kind of key trends. You know, bo both seagrass and marsh um, have quite diverse assemblages. Um, we see some of the gobies and the sparids uh, making up a majority of the, the collections. And then some of the more economically important species, the cyanids. The cyanid family includes species like the spotted sea trout, the red drum, Atlantic croaker that have, you know, some, you know, uh, commercial and recreational uh, uh, 
economic importance. OK. And so uh, the the last uh, survey is going to be coming up in December uh, for for this particular component. And then um, very, very easy for me to sit here and say complete all sorting processing <laughs> and collections because I've been there and done that. It is a lot of work that Liam and, and the team and, and Greg's team putting in with the invertebrates are doing processing, identifying all of these little critters um, that are recruiting to these 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 habitats in Matagorda Bay. I mean, that's that's a project in itself. Um, so, you know, I wanted to definitely make sure that everyone's aware of that that hasn't hasn't done that. So that first bullet point is is pretty significant. Um, but then the other the other two bullet points are obviously um, uh, significant as well Qu to continue quantifying the nutritional condition um, using the RNA DNA ratios of a model species, uh, the spotted sea trout to assess habitat quality. And so Liam's doing some um, some trials that he can certainly speak uh, to either now or uh, at another time, uh, both in the lab and the field. And um, ultimately, we're hoping that these uh, these products um, will really kind of help evaluate the the quality of these different nursery habitats to fish and invertebrates in Matagorda Bay. All right. Well, thanks, Dave. That that's next. And Dr. Wells, don't go too far because your component of this is is up next. We asked Dave in the interest of time to speak on behalf of a lot of us working on this necton component. Um, and so I want to just briefly show this picture. We're doing something very similar with the same set of samples for the invertebrate community and crustaceans, crabs and shrimp and that sort of thing. But I thought this picture really captured well a lot of uh, what you see in that tray there is just from one sample alone. So it covers roughly 10 square meters or 10 square yards of habitat. So it's not a big area, but you can see the amount of productivity that's coming out of these very small areas, which is very indicative of, of what value these habitats are in Matagorda Bay. Of course, establishing this baseline that we talked about earlier is going to be really essential to understand these habitats, prioritizing for restoration and a whole host of, of other things. So we don't have time today to talk about the invertebrate community. Surely we will um, do that in the final report and when we, we wrap up the, the projects, but we've got that component going as well. I don't want everyone to think it's just, just about the, the fish component. But Dr. Wells, I'm going to go ahead, if you're ready, move into to your food web component of um, the project to talk about what you guys have going on there. Sure. Thanks, Greg. Um... And so this is good. this is all connected to a, a lot of the work that you've been hearing about today. Um, and so this is uh, Emily Meese, a PhD student in the lab. Uh, this is all of uh, her work um, looking at the food web. And so the study objectives uh, for her are in green and blue. Number one, to quantify the baselines of the Matagorda food web uh, primary producers. You've got a, we've got a lot of diverse um, pieces of organic material that can be very important in driving production in the system from POM, the particular organic matter, or kind of the phytoplankton community, um, to uh, what Dr. Pollock was talking about, the benthic microalgae that lives down in the sand, the BMA, detritus, the seagrass, the Spartina mar uh, marsh plants, the macroalgae. Um, and collecting all of that and processing it is certainly, um, you know, a, a significant effort in itself. And then number two, um, to assess the food web structure and function of these consumers. And then to try to link um, one to two, what, of, what, what percent of these uh, producers, primary producers in green, are contributing to these upper level consumers in blue. And so that's kind of the ultimate question. And to get all of these critters, as everyone knows, you need a, a variety of different gear types. So gear used, you can see the long laundry list that just seems to keep expanding and expanding um, in order to get the, the, the key species needed um, to kind of get at the ecosystem level and be able to get everything. And then the top right corner um, kind of shows Emily's uh, sampling scheme. So really trying to, um, you know, sample throughout the bay, um, east to west, north to south, um, over a variety of different habitats. Okay, Greg. 
And so progress to date, um, Emily's collected a lot, <laughs> just like everybody else. Um, 770 muscle biopsies have been pulled, um, majority of them from uh, what we're uh, defining as fish, bony fishes versus the elasmobranchs are the, you know, the stingrays and the sharks, um, invertebrates as well, blue crabs. And the top uh, fish species so far include these, these five, the hardhead catfish, striped mullet, menhaden, pinfish, and spotted sea trout. And so they'll probably be um, used pretty heavily um, with some of the, the trophic work that we're doing. And then the top uh, elasmobranchs that we've collected so far include the Atlantic stingrays and the bull sharks. So lots of samples uh, to be processed. And, uh, and, and analyzed. And so far, um, you know, the primary producers have been uh, analyzed and that's is, is others that have done this kind of work. That's a, 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 a significant effort. Um, 2020, um, all those primary producers have been analyzed. And I show a little uh, plot here that Emily created on uh, carbon nitrogen. And we don't need to get into the details of trying to dissect this, but the, the good thing is those are four really key producers um, in the ecosystem we talked about, the benthic microalgae, BMA, the seagrass, the mangroves, and PO in particular, organic matter, a proxy of phytoplankton. And what's good is they're all very different from one another. That's really needed in order to do what we're, what we're all trying to attempt to do in, in terms of assessing their role, their value as organic matter to these producers in the ecosystem. So that's, that's very encouraging. So more to come there for sure. Um, but the 2021 samples have been processed and, and shipped off. Uh, we do have one more uh, sample um, trip coming up in, in December and we'll, we'll incorporate that as well. And then in terms of consumers, um, a big chunk have been processed and shipped off. And when I say shipped off, we're shipping these to uh, a stable isotope lab. Um, and then those get in, in queue for the machine that um, produces the results that we then uh, uh, interpret and, and plot up. And then another 600 are currently being processed. So we certainly have our, our, our hands full. And like Greg mentioned, you can see in the top right, uh, or sorry, bottom right, bottom right, the, the, the diversity that you can get just within a single site um, can, can just be incredible. All right, Greg. Oh, I think that's it for me. Okay. Well, thanks, doc, Dr. Wells. Um, and moving on, uh, up next is, uh, Mike, are you you're there if you're ready? Um, Dr. Wetz has been doing a whole bunch of work related to the water quality and some other plankton work throughout the bay really key um, and also he's developed a really nice um, citizen science program where volunteers are helping out um, collecting some of this data so it really meshes well with a lot of goals of this project uh, so dr wetz if you're ready whenever you're ready go ahead okay well good evening everybody um, i assume you can hear me okay yep, um, so we've heard a lot about primary producers and and that's really what my lab is focusing on or are trying to quantify the water column primary producers the phytoplankton uh which, so obviously very important being at the base of the food web and we're also focused on just overall water quality conditions in the bay because it's the water quality that kind of really sets the stage for everything else without healthy water quality it's really hard to support some of the other um, aspects of the ecosystem so unfortunately, unlike everybody else, um, water quality studies do not lend themselves great to, to pictures. So, you know, my group, we get really excited when we see any water color other than brown. Um, but you can imagine there's really not much you can do with that in terms of pictures. So um, I'm just going to briefly give an update on where we're at with the water quality assessments at this point. The first um, task that we undertook was trying to quantify longer term trends in water quality conditions throughout Matagorda Bay, not just in that that area um, towards towards the mouth and towards the barrier island, but throughout the Matagorda Bay ecosystem. And so what we've been doing is analyzing historical data from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And for many of these these stations that you see on this map, the data goes back to 
the 1980s, the 1990s, sometimes even earlier than that. And so we've actually just completed um, completed an initial um, snapshot of the the data analysis, and we're kind of doing some some QCing right now. But uh, we should have a, a, a more complete picture by January. Greg, could you move us forward? Uh, oh, um, just click on this a few times. Uh, yeah, that, 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 OK, there you go. So um, so we've been focused on Matagorda Bay, but we've also been looking at the broader Texas coast to try and put things in perspective. And one of the, the preliminary um, findings that I would say uh, is most relevant to this project is that we're starting to see some issues of concern, especially in the upper part of the bay, up in uh, Lavaca Bay, Cox Bay, and the Keller Bay area. And these primarily, the, these issues primarily relate to nutrient inputs. So um, it's starting to look like we're seeing some issues with um, excessive nitrogen and phosphorus inputs that then have negative impacts on um, the water bodies where, where they are, um, are going into the bay. And so the rest of Matagorda Bay from from our initial analysis seems to be fairly healthy. We don't see any issues. But again, it's that Lavaca, Cox, and Keller Bay um, area where we're starting to see some challenges that we um, want to start a conversation on um, so that we can start thinking about longer term. What does this mean and what do we do about it? Next, please. OK, so our other component has been a monthly uh, water quality and plankton sampling that's occurred in that um, outer part of the bay. And as Greg mentioned, we've been working with a couple of dedicated volunteers, uh, Jim Gann and, and Buzzy Romine, who've been taking us out, and then also Ed's group at BioWest have been great. And so our overall goal with this component is to not only characterize the water conditions and the plankton in this area, but also to look at the variability and in particular look at how the um, the primary producers respond to variability in river flow coming from from the uh, from the Colorado River out into the delta. So again, we've we've been doing monthly boat based sampling at eleven stations. And in fact, we just completed our last sampling run in October. So we now have two full years of data. And that data really covers some, some nice uh, inflow conditions, ranging from low inflow up to um, higher freshwater inflow conditions. And the samples will be analyzed uh, by the end of January. We should be ready to really start saying some things about that data. But we'll end up with these nice maps you know, showing the salinity conditions and chlorophyll, for example, nutrients, and we'll be able to relate those back to um, to what the river is doing. And it turns out that um, from the initial analysis of this data, the, the river plays a major role in terms of fertilizing that delta and supporting the productivity that then is so important for the fish and, and everything else. And um, I will say one concern that I've heard um, pretty extensively from stakeholders recently is is concerned that the Delta region and in particular the cut through there may be starting to um, try and characterize this the right way. It's trying to, it's starting to fill in. So it's getting um, pretty skinny at times. And so there's concern about what happens if that connection with the river is lost over time. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be really trying to to look at with our data set is what happens when you get for example, low water conditions or uh, low inflow conditions. What does that mean for the productivity of the bay? And I think we can start to make some assessments with this data. Um, next. So just to, just to again, highlight our, our volunteers. This is Jim and Buzzy, and, and they've, they've given us two years of their time. They've been great, and we look forward to continue to work with them in different capacities um, as, as we go forward in time. All right, Greg, next. I just wanted to briefly highlight a couple of other projects. Uh, this one, which um, has been uh, sort of leveraging findings from the Comptroller project. One of the issues that has affected both Matagorda and in San Antonio Bay over the last two decades has, has been harmful algal blooms that end up um, resulting in the shellfish harvesting being closed. And that has some obvious impacts on the the economy and well-being of the surrounding community. 
So we were able to, to leverage some findings uh, from this project to get funding from the Matagorda Bay Trust to implement a uh, more rigorous harmful algal bloom sampling program in Matagorda Bay. And one of the things we're, we're really excited about is we're going to be able to put a real-time harmful algal bloom sensor in at Port O'Connor, which will give us basically a real-time warning of when we have these, these harmful algae in the system so that we can take actions to mitigate any potential impacts. And so that'll be going in sometime next spring. Uh, that'll be deployed next spring. So we're really excited about this project. And next. And lastly, I just want to highlight another project that we have that, that builds on findings from this project. And that is the um, Texas Coast Ecosystem Health Assessments. We call it the report card. Um, and basically what we're doing is is taking the stakeholder um, driven approach to assess the health of the um, the bays and the economy uh, surrounding the bays on the Texas coast. And one of the areas that we're focused on is Matagorda Bay. Um, and so we're trying to take um, a snapshot of all the different important indicators that, that tell us about the health of the bay and trying to quantify uh, and trying trying to assign a, a value, I guess you could say, to the health of the bay. So we just completed our first stakeholder workshop for the Matagorda Bay ecosystem, but there's going to be more opportunities to participate here in the spring. So if you are interested in in working with us to try and figure out how healthy the bay really is, uh, please do reach out to me. We're, we're definitely excited when we get um, interested folks involved in this. And that's it. Thanks, Greg. Well, thank, thank, sorry, <clears throat> thanks, Dr. West. That's great. Uh, you know, and I think as you mentioned, um, th this is all really good work, especially the implications of potential river silting in. But you know, if it doesn't happen with the water quality, it doesn't happen with all these other components that we've been talking about. So I appreciate you bringing that up, and so very, very good information, Mike. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, up next, uh, I just briefly asked uh, Quentin Hall with our group to discuss um, some of our acoustic array that we have deployed to track the animals that we're tracking in this network. And of course, lastly, um, Dr. Um, Plotkin will talk about some of the sea turtle work, which is um, keeping you on the edge of your seat for that. But this is another interesting component, and I know we're running a little bit long here, but but we've got had a lot of ground to cover with, with all of this science. And so if you'll bear with us for a few minutes, we'll open up for some question and answer after the sea turtle component. But Quentin, if you're ready, do you want to talk to us a little, just very briefly about the, the acoustic receiver array that we have out? Sure. So like Greg mentioned, uh, we do have an acoustic receiver array deployed in the bay. Uh, can you advance the slide, Greg? And uh, so we have these, these receivers in the bay in, in multiple locations, which are represented by these blue triangles. And uh, they actually are very, very sensitive listening devices that pick up on uh, the transmitters that have been deployed by Dr. Plotkin's group on sea turtles, and then also uh, some, some fish species from other projects um, that may happen to be in this area as well. And so what this allows us to do is actually track individual animals uh, throughout these uh, base systems. And uh, it really pr provides a lot of uh, fine scale movement uh, data for us, particularly in the Pascavallo and the shipping channel area, uh, which interestingly enough, and Dr. Plock, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, uh, happens to be where a lot of these turtles seem to be hanging out. So uh, that requires us to go out twice a year and physically retrieve these receivers. Uh, we download the data and then we disperse that to the individual PIs with tagged animals in this area. So we just want to give you a quick background on, on this component of this, uh, the study before uh, Dr. Plotkin takes us a little bit further and tells us about the turtle work. Well, thanks, Quentin. That's great. And thanks for that brief summary. And, you know, maintaining this array is, is quite the work. And I know Quentin and his team spent a lot of time up there doing that. And, and I'm really looking forward to the results of this once we see how these animals are integrated and moving among these, these areas which are strategically placed. So that'll be very interesting and, and complement the satellite work that Dr. Plotkin is doing that we'll hear about here, here next in just a second. So um, thank you for doing that, Quentin. So um, 
Up next is Dr. Plotkin. She and her team are leading the uh, very charismatic sea turtle component um, of this work. And her and Dr. Wilderman um, have been working hard along with several other of the team members to uh, get all the turtles tag tagged through freezes and all kind of other challenges that we had, but they, they prevailed and, and done a great job. So Pam, when you're ready, um, uh, go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Greg. Can you hear me? Sure, I can okay, hear you. I'll, I'll advance the slides when you're ready. Excellent, thank you. Well, howdy, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about the work that the uh, turtle team completed over the last few seasons. And this is a, a, a beautiful slide uh, put together by Dr. Wilderman that uh, shows you a summary of the turtles that we captured in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And so, um, among those uh, years, we were able to capture 33 uh, individual sea turtles. 32 of those turtles were green sea turtles. Uh, we've got a picture of one in the upper right-hand side of your screen. Um, a nice little uh, shiny, fat green sea turtle. That's a, a juvenile sea turtle. And then um, at the very end of our sampling, uh, which occurred in 2021, um, Dr. Wilderman and the team caught a, a beautiful little Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is shown in the bottom right hand side of, of this slide. Um, so you can see uh, among those years, we, we caught um, eight turtles in 2019. We caught one in 2020, and um, that is a result of, of COVID and uh, not being able to get out and, and sample uh, and travel as, as we had hoped to do in 2020. And thankfully um, in 2021, despite a, um, a pretty severe freeze uh, that occurred in Texas and, and killed over, well, killed thousands of sea turtles and stranded over 13,000 sea turtles along the Texas coast, we were still able to catch turtles that were alive and happy and healthy in uh, in Matagorda Bay. So we got 24 in, in 2021. And next to those numbers, you see how many turtles we fitted with satellite transmitters and how many turtles we attached acoustic transmitters to. So altogether, we uh, deployed 20 satellite transmitters over the three years and 12 acoustic transmitters. And I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit about the turtles that we found um, both in our nets. And here's a picture of our net in this slide on the left hand side. Um, we use these very long 300 um, foot long entanglement nets, typically fish two nets at one time. And um, when we're in deep water, we're fishing 12 foot uh, wide nets. And when we're in shallow water, we're using six foot deep nets. Um, we had better luck with the six foot deep nets. And so we tended to um, use those and, and stay in shallower waters where we had much better success uh, with, with that. Uh, netting method. Next slide, please. So here on the left hand side of this slide, you can see the locations where the turtle team worked. Every place you see a circle, that's a, a, a location where we set our nets and we sampled for one or two days. And um, all those white circles indicate that there were zero turtles caught in those locations. All of the other colored um, circles tell you how many turtles were captured in our nets in those locations. And so um, you can see um, fairly easily on this map that we had great success um, in, in the lower left hand side of, of um, this, the the map area near Pascavayo and, and that part of Matagorda Bay. So that's um, certainly an area that, uh, that we were successful in and, and where we saw sea turtles. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, where we saw sea turtles in, 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 in one of the future slides. But in the top right hand um, portion of this um, slide, you see a, a, a histogram there, and that is a, is a nice figure that shows you the size of the sea turtles that we caught in our nets and the size of the sea turtles that Dr. Wilderman 
retrieved after the freeze. And that's a picture on the bottom right hand side of Dr. Wilderman with um, with several dozen dead green sea turtles in her boat. And so as soon as it was safe to um, to travel, Dr. Wilderman went out uh, in the boat and she scoured the shores of Matagorda Bay uh, and looked for dead sea turtles that she could collect data from. And she was able to get about 65 sea turtles. And um, the size of the turtles are displayed in that figure in the top right hand side. So what this shows you is that, you know, there are some very small turtles uh, in Matagorda Bay. There are also a few very big turtles in, in Matagorda Bay. And um, the ones to the left hand side are, are considered young juvenile turtles and the ones to the further right hand side are what we might call sub-adult uh, sea turtles. So, um, so a good um, uh, group of turtles were, were retrieved. You can see a little bit of the size variation from the turtles that are in the boat. There's a lot of color variation um, and also a lot of variation in terms of their state of decomposition. So some of them um, you know, were salvageable and we were able to get some samples, skin samples and, and shell samples that are gonna be used for stable isotope analysis. We we're also able to determine the gender of some of these turtles. We found males, we found females, and um, we we're also able to um, actually retrieve one of our satellite transmitters that had been attached to a turtle, had stopped transmitting, and the turtle had sunk to the bottom. And apparently after the freeze, it came back up to the surface and, and we we're able to, to recover that. So we've still got a lot of data analysis to do. Um, with the stranded turtles, and um, you'll hear more about that uh, in, in the future. Next slide, please. So if you take a look at this um, left picture, uh, left side picture, you'll see a bunch of animations there. Each animation, each color line displays a different sea turtle that we tracked with a satellite transmitter. And so um, it's it's hard to freeze it, um, but um, right now we're just at the initial stages of analyzing the tracking data for these turtles. And what we found were that most of the sea turtles that, that we put satellite transmitters on did stay in Matagorda Bay. They um, had, um, had very small home ranges in some instances, uh, and they, um, they transmitted for several months before they stopped transmitting. Um, but I do wanna call your attention to the map on the right-hand side because we've pulled out a couple of turtles that uh, that that traveled uh, greater distances, and so you'll see, um, in particular, a red line uh, in that map, and that shows you one turtle that left Matagorda Bay when the water got too cold, and she headed to Mexico and um, swam all the way into Mexican waters, and then turned around, headed north back towards Texas entered the Laguna Madre and hung out in the Laguna Madre for um, for quite a while until she stopped transmitting. Um, and um, so this is really kind of cool because it shows that some of the Matagorda Bay turtles do leave Matagorda Bay. They travel into international waters uh, and, and then um, use other bay systems along the Texas coast. And so the connectivity uh, aspect of this is is really pretty exciting. We had another turtle. I think it's uh, the yellow line or the green line, um, which shows you another turtle that left Matagorda Bay and headed south also, and then came back up and was last transmitting off near Corpus Christi Bay. So some of the turtles are able to um, to perceive the the cold weather uh, advancing and leave the bay go out into the gulf of mexico into warmer waters and um and find shelter while other turtles don't um don't adhere to that same pattern and don't 
perceived those cues to be important enough for them to leave the bay. And as we saw in this last freeze, some of them died in in the bay. And and so um, that's that's the a big sixty four thousand dollar question. Why do some of the turtles leave and and others stay? Um, so next slide, please. So I did want to um, mention that even though we weren't actually in the field very much in 2020, we were still very um, actively working on this project and we focused on um, outreach and partnerships uh, a little bit more than we had in 2019. Um, and one of the things that I think was most exciting was that we developed an app and we named the app I Sea Turtle and um, stole that from, from Greg Stunz's very popular Eye Snapper. And uh, uh, so I Sea Turtle was developed by, um, by Dr. Wilderman and, and Dustin Baumbach, and it was meant to engage people during the COVID shutdown in particular, because we had heard that people, even though you know we were all supposed to be at home, there were a lot of people still out in boats, going out fishing, and still enjoying the great outdoors uh, of Texas. And so we thought this was a great opportunity to, to get public involvement to help us understand where the sea turtles were located. And so I see Turtle App was one of the, the great projects that we came up with. We also did a lot of um, webinars and summer camps. And um, one of the great heroes of, of our outreach and partnerships is, is uh, the Texas Sea Grant Extension um, Specialist, um, RJ Shelley from, from um, the Matagorda Bay area. And so um, big, big thanks to RJ. He was able to engage fishermen and, and captains into helping us uh, locate sea turtles with the I Sea Turtle app. He also connected us to the communities and the summer camps, and, um, and we couldn't have had such great success with this outreach um, without him. So uh, next slide, please. So, um, all of our data are publicly available. The satellite tracking data is publicly available. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can actually follow the sea turtles. I didn't have time to show you all of the sea turtle tracks today, um, but there's a composite there uh, that shows you some of the points. Um, so if you go to that URL, the portal.atn, which is the animal telemetry network, you can go and, and see um, our turtles that we've tracked from Matagorda Bay. If you look on the left hand side of the screen, that's a nice little map that Dr. Wilderman put together that shows you all of the sea turtle sightings that we got from the I Sea Turtle app. And um, she has highlighted areas that were um, uh, the areas that were most densely um, uh, identified by, by local fishermen. Next slide, please. So we're still analyzing data. We've got a lot of data analyzed from the acoustic transmitters, which I haven't shown you today, from the satellite transmitters, and also from um, the analyses of skin and scoot uh, samples that are gonna tell us a little bit more about where these turtles are feeding and how they're feeding. And so we've got um, all of those data analyses um, lined up for, for the rest of this year and into 2022. And, and we look forward to sharing the story about what the sea turtles are doing and where they're going and what habitats they're using and, and layering that data on top of all of the data that you've uh, seen tonight and um, have a really great visualization to show you uh, what, what is important to sea turtles in Matagorda Bay. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, well, thanks, Dr. Plotkin. That's great. That's great. And I and just wanted I, to reiterate a little bit about, you know, the freeze was was obviously a devastating event for not only turtles and fish as well and other, many other things. But, you know, that was a little bit of a silver lining where, you know, having to work with endangered species, as you well know, is very difficult, much less getting tissues from them and that sort of thing. But it did provide a benefit. and We were able to utilize some of those animals that unfortunately didn't make it. So that's great. And of course, I know you'll be here. We'll be hearing a lot more from your team and others about how we've integrated those in the food web um, work and all kind of other stuff. So we really appreciate that, Pam. So thanks a lot for all the hard work of your team.
Well, moving on in Chelsea, I'll wrap it up here and there's time for conservation, uh, cons time, conservation time for questions. Um, I know we went a little long here, but we obviously had a lot of ground to cover to get through all the science and, and we, there's certainly a lot more um, to go. And uh, we'll, we're really looking forward to um, hopefully this next meeting will be in person where we can have a lot more engagement and that kind of thing. But I, I really want to thank our team for working so hard up to this point. We still got a lot of work to do. It's going to take us, you know, the full year to really wrap this up and do all the things that we need to do in terms of the scientific rigor that's needed, as well as preparing things for stakeholder groups like this in a really user friendly format to understand um, some of the work we do and the implications for Matagorda Bay and how to make that a better place now and in the future and for future generations. And so I just put our slide back up here to remind everyone um, of the goals and that kind of thing. But it, at this point, Chelsea, we'll be happy to, to ask any questions or answer or answer any questions that um, folks might have. I'll, I'll also go ahead and stop sharing my screen too here if I can. Maybe. Yeah, folks are welcome to unmute themselves. Oh, oh I'm trouble. Okay. Unmute themselves and ask questions. Uh, quick housekeeping here. This meeting has been recorded. Again, we appreciate everyone sticking around. Um, we will have the recording available in the next few weeks, give or take with the holidays coming up, um, and be able to share that through our typical emails and social medias um, moving forward. But thanks again for tuning in. So Chelsea, for ways for them to answer, ask questions, do do can they just unmute themselves or do they need to type something in the, the chat box or how do you recommend that? More than welcome to unmute if you've got a question. Um, it's easy enough for a small group today. Also a lot of information at one time. So. Uh, yeah, well, that's <laughs> that, that was quite the challenge to be able to, to fit that into the hour, really hour and 20. But, you know, that's that's a lot of work and, you know, we're certainly very proud of that. And we have, um, you know, a lot more a lot more to um, to assemble and, and compile. Yeah, I look forward to next year and I think in person would be wonderful. This is Mike, I guess I'm going to ask a question for Pam. Um, so I'm guessing that the turtles are, are, are in the bay because of the, the habitat and food resources. Are there any barriers to them moving around into other parts of the bay, like salinity, for example, or, or any other things that pre prevent them from sort of spreading out? That's a good question. Um, as reptiles, you know, temperature is more important to them than any other um, physical uh, variable. And so um, so I, I, I don't think that there's a, a, a temperature barrier for them in the bay. Instead, you know, what we believe is that they are they are finding a, a nice place to feed in the seagrass bed and they are hanging out in those areas where there's ample seagrass for them to eat and um, we just don't see a lot of movement um, within an individual turtle um, that is resident in Matagorda Bay. The few turtles that we tracked outside of Matagorda Bay um, certainly left when there was cold weather coming and so temperature was probably the cue that sent them elsewhere. Um, for those turtles that did stay in Matagorda Bay, we find that they tend to, you know, slow down. They tend to hunker down on the bottom. Um, and we actually, I believe it was December of 2019, um, captured a number of turtles that had significant amounts of mud on their shells, suggesting that 
they had been buried in the mud at some point during the evening or the morning before we caught them. So, um, so there's still a lot to learn about the turtles in Matagorda Bay and how they are responding to temperature of the water. But I don't, I don't, I don't know about salinity as being a, a major, major, uh, major factor in in their choice of habitats. Thank you. Um, one other just last thing is that, um, you know, a couple of people have asked me, why do you tend to see them concentrated in that Pascavallo area and and not in some of the other areas? And the Pascavallo area, as you know, is a really nice protected area. And um, it also gives the turtles an opportunity to get out of the bay if they are living and feeding close to that opening out into the Gulf of Mexico. So that could be one reason, one of many reasons why, you know, we found more turtles concentrated in that area, as did the fishermen who were reporting sea turtles using the IC Turtle app. All right. Well, I can I can talk slowly in case anyone has a last minute question, but sounds like we are just about ready to wrap up the evening. Thanks again. This is, thanks. This is Mike. Can I ask one more question then? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I know everybody's go. Greg's probably going to strangle me tomorrow. <laughs> um, so this is for Ed and, and Jim. Uh, uh, so it seems like seagrasses are the the uh, I'm sorry, Jenny's texting me saying no. <laughs> um, it seems like seagrasses are the, the critical element here for the sea turtles. Um, and given the concerns that some of the stakeholders have raised about the silting in of that that um, connection between the Colorado River and the Delta itself, are there um, historical analogs where you might be able to go back and look at what seagrass distributions were like at some other time when you know, there may not have been a great uh, connection between the river and the bay itself. I mean, is, is there a way of of kind of predicting what seagrass might do if that if that connection really is lost? Yeah, um, Greg, this is Jim. I mean, uh, Mike. Um, yeah, we we can go back in time and that that channel that is um, connecting with the eastern part of Managorda Bay there uh, wasn't, hasn't always been there, actually. So uh, we can go back, and I'm trying to remember exactly when that was dredged, but it was probably uh, before 1990 or thereabouts. And we, we could go back and, and um, retrace how th that system changed once the channel was open and then uh, presumably um, reverse it to some effect if it's closed again. So yeah, there's there's some information there that could be useful. Do you know if there's any historical seagrass data that might predate that mm. channel opening? Um, n not that I'm aware of, maybe Ed, Ed knows of, um, but we do have, um, I'd have to look. We do have a seagrass layer that that we use, but I believe it's all post opening of that um, channel. OK, thanks, Jim. Sure, you're welcome. Well, Chelsea, I would like to remind the group as well and those attending that, you know, the, the PIs are, are here and always more than willing to answer any questions, you know, outside of a formal meeting like this and that kind of thing. And they just need to reach out. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking now, Chelsea, we maybe should have mentioned or maybe we did, you know, the website and all the work that you and your team have been doing regarding, um, uh, you know, reach outreaching this information and all of our contacts are on there as well as yours and that kind of thing. So um, I probably should have put that in a slide, um, but I didn't think about it. But, you know, we we have there's a lot of information out there on the project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This will we'll do 
we'll keep trying to keep it all in the same place. It's fascinating to see like Dr. Plotkin and, and all the products coming from your team. It's it's going to be worthwhile to go back through and consolidate that so folks can kind of find their own flavor of how to digest this project. Um, but no, that information is still available on our websites. We'll share it when we share the meeting recording um, and, and keep keep building off of it for the next year. All right, well, I think Dr. Wetz has asked all of his questions. Um, <laughs> hey now, I'm texting nice. him <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for y'all's time, especially off the clock like this. Appreciate the presentations we had today, such high quality, so wonderful to see all the data that's starting to stream in from this work. Really look forward to talking about it more so even next year when we're kind of starting to consolidate it all and make it into one big picture. Um, but thanks so much for your time. And yeah, we're always available. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.